Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. ESCOM instituted its first round of load shedding this week after a short period of reprieve. Terence Creeman joins me to discuss the causes of the latest cuts and the prognosis for 2022. Hi, Terence. Hello, Sashni. So, did ESCOM's uh, recent load shedding declaration come as a surprise? Yes and no. Yes, because the performance uh, over December and early January, uh, or most of January, was pretty good. And we saw the level of unplanned outages fall, despite heavy rains during the period. So they navigated that period of uh, uh, January when it was raining all over the country pretty well. We've known wet coal has always been an issue for Eskom in the past. Uh, and they gave a state of the system update where you know um, there was less than 10,000 megawatts of unplanned outages. A few days later, we we're up to about 14,000 megawatts. So the, the rate of change was quite incredible from the time that they announced uh, the state of the system where they were hoping to avoid load shedding for the rest of summer uh, if they could keep their unplanned outages uh, below uh, a certain threshold around 12,000 megawatts. And then a few days later when we were deep into stage two load shedding for uh, six consecutive days, uh, which probably will not be sustained for the full six days, but still, uh, so it was somewhat of a surprise, but on the other hand, what has really changed? You know, we know the precarious situation that we've been in for these many years, which have only really gotten worse as Eskim has upped its planned reliability maintenance, which has fallen behind schedule. They had to defer a lot uh, of that, mostly because they didn't have the liquidity or the money uh, to plan properly. They didn't have the skills uh, to get all that uh, upfront planning in place. And uh, basically, there's just not enough time in the system to get this backlog under control. So nothing has really changed from a very intensive two years of load shedding. 2020, we were hoping would be the worst year of load shedding. It didn't turn out that way. 2021 was even worse. Uh, and we'll have to now see as 2022 unfolds uh, what will happen. But definitely the maintenance backlog is not there. The coal fleet is not reliable and therefore we are always in a precarious state. And what's underpinned this intense load shedding? Well, it basically comes down to a maintenance backlog that was allowed to build up over so many, many years, uh, which is now having to be clawed back. We've got an old uh, fleet, we've got new plant that is not reliable at all. In fact, this most recent intense period uh, is largely down to really a very poor performance out of Kusile power stations. Out of those units, three of them are in commercial operation, one non-commercial, and all of them were down, um, and all went down in a very quick order over those few days after the state of the system uh, update. The best performing, ironically, is the non-commercial unit, uh, unit four, um, and that's delivering the best, but there's still a number of issues at Kusile that haven't been sorted out. So we've got this backlog, we've got a poor performance out of the new plant and the Dupli and the Kusile plant and uh, really getting our hands around this backlog because it's across quite a lot of units, a number of units, some are bigger, some are smaller and there's, there's a feeling maybe that Eskom should be just focusing on retiring uh, the, the ones that are performing the best in the best possible way and that means actually forgetting about maintaining right across the fleet, but that's a debate because it really is almost an impossible task when you've got so many balls in the air and there has been call for maybe more focus uh, on the maintenance uh, around those big, more reliable units and get those ones operating as best as possible and then progressively uh, decommission as per the IRP squid schedule, which says that about 10,000 uh, uh, megawatts needs to be decommissioned by the end of this decade, but maybe even at an accelerated pace and become more realistic about what the coal fleet can deliver. Now, load shedding was used to replenish pump storage dams. So what does this tell us about the nature of the problem? Well, the nature of the problem is that we don't have enough energy in the system. So everyone talks about capacity and we saw the risk mitigation program was designed to add a lot more capacity into the system. But uh, capacity, as one analyst pointed out, is almost like the heart and uh, whether it can pump. But if you don't have blood pumping through the heart, you can't uh, use that capacity. So we've had to load shed uh, to get enough energy to replenish the upper dams for the pump storage, which creates the capacity. And then when you release that, uh, that water, it creates the energy. 
So we actually do have quite a lot of capacity in the system, but we aren't able to use it optimally. And we are designing uh, m many of our procurement programs, especially the emergency one, which has been much delayed uh, and is going to be hugely expensive if it ever gets to financial close, uh, to, to add capacity, which basically gives the system operator dispatchable electricity between five in the morning and nine at night. Really what we need is to accelerate the build program of, for energy, which is really what renewables, and they're the cheapest, as we know, can, uh, can add almost and a lot quicker than what it can be, uh, can be to add, for instance, what they used to call base load, which is a term that I think is no longer relevant, given that there's our cheapest and uh, most quick uh, financeable electricity is now renewable energy, and we have to adapt now to that. Those are the workhorses of the system. It's no longer coal, and we're going to have to build a system around that. So uh, that's really where our focus should be. And the short-term opportunities to lower the risk? The short-term opportunities are all about really the coal fleet and focused on that maintenance, getting it as reliable as possible. And I think being more realistic about what this coal fleet can deliver. I mean, when we talk about over 70% energy availability factor in the integrated resource plan and in ESKIM's plan and in its performance indicators, and they're delivering at closer to 60%, 62%, and the outlook is for more 62%, you know, is this really realistic? Let's have a realistic view on what the coal fleet can deliver and over how long uh, and how are we going to start supporting that coal fleet as it sort of tapers off. And the long-term remedy? The long-term remedy is we have to be building, as one analyst says, solar and wind as if our life and lives and livelihoods depend on it. And we need to do that as quickly as possible. We shouldn't be f uh, faffing around with a risk mitigation program that's entirely inappropriate. We possibly shouldn't even be faffing around with the extension of, of Kuberg for another 20 years, but that ship seems to have sailed. But, you know, we really need to focus on what the system of the future is going to look like. It's the workhorses are going to be variable renewable energy. Then you build your capacity and scale your capacity, which is going to be used as a backup, whether it's battery storage, uh, peaking gas plants, or what, and pump storage. You scale that appropriately for when there's a wind still night. And we really aren't getting our head around it. And if we do, the opportunities are immense in this transitioning world because you're going to have this massive amount of surplus uh, time at, during the day, which we can then convert into uh, charging electric vehicles. So we can start our ma manufacturing of electric vehicles because we could have a very large fleet of electric vehicles in South Africa. We can electrify more, th more things that are not electrified, although we, we're quite good on that front as a country because we've always had cheap electricity, but this electrification of other services from mobility to heating, etc., that we can start really pushing, pushing that. And then we'll have the opportunity to do other things with the surplus energy during the day. Desalination, where we know we are a water-stressed country, and parts of the country are going to become more de uh, distressed as we enter these phases of climate change. Parts of the country will obviously get wetter because of the way climate change uh, is evolving but there will be a risk of drought in a lot of uh, uh, South Africa. And then there's the green hydrogen opportunity. If you've got uh, cheap, uh, clean electricity uh, and it's in surplus and it's basically almost for free because you can't use it for anything else, you're going to just curtail it otherwise, there's a huge opportunity to convert that into uh, a different form of gas, a clean gas, which is green hydrogen, which can be used uh, in a range of things. Outside of the electricity sector, yes, it could be helped for some of that balancing that we speak about, that capacity that we need to switch on quickly, but that's not really its main role. Its main role is going to be to decarbonize sectors like green steel, long uh, distance transport, maritime, uh, uh, maritime shipping, uh, making carbon neutral um, aviation fuel. So, but we have to get the policy building blocks in place to do that. And is our energy policy equipped to end the electricity crisis? No, <laughs> is the short <laughs> answer. We need to have a policy that is aligned to the workhorses of the system being variable renewable energy. And still we're talking about base load as a concept which no one in the world is really talking about anymore. They're moving uh, where you've got the resources like the Chile and Australia and us and Morocco, they're really moving to systems where 
uh, that the variable renewable energy is going to be this workhorse of the electricity system, and it's going to create these, these power to X opportunities, as people call them, where you're going to take this power, the surplus cheap power that's coming from the sun and the wind, and you're going to convert them into these other uh, very high demand uh, fuels, chemicals, products that are, are going to be in demand in those countries that just don't have the same renew renewables resources and land that South Africa has. So we're in a very advantageous position for the transition, but our policy is not keeping up. Thanks for speaking with us, Terence. Thank you. That's it for today. Join us again next week for more news analysis. And don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News daily email newsletter.